I'm gonna call my uh, uh, the speakers already. The need of of AXA. I'm just gonna call them so we can speed up. Um, Julie Batch of IAG and uh, Dave Jones, the Insurance Commissioner of the California Department of Insurance. So our 30 minutes became 20 minutes. We'll try to get that going. First, the PSI. What is the master narrative of the principles for stable insurance? The master narrative of the PSI is we want to harness the full potential of the insurance industry as risk managers, as insurers, and as investors for sustainable business and for sustainable development. This morning, we saw AXA CEO just do that in the context of climate change, whether it's TCFD on climate risk assessment, insurance solutions on climate uh, change risks, or investments and decarbonization. These are the three things that the PSI is trying to harness for the insurance industry. If you look at the PSI and as a set of principles, uh, 11 of the top 12 uh, uh, insurers on the Dow Jones Sustainability Indices are PSI signatories, and they are all here. Um, AXA is not alone. They're joined by IAG, by Allianz, by, I, uh, by Munich Re, Swiss Re, Zurich, and Generali in driving this agenda forward. And just to give you a flavor of what insurers have been doing, this is not just the past year, this is just the last six months of what they've been trying to do. Two weeks ago, insurers, 16 insurers um, representing 10% of world premium volume and five trillion in assets, uh, committed to pilot the TCFD recommendations um, into climate risk assessment. Brazil, um, last May, became the first insurance market in the world to commit to climate risk transparency. And obviously, we heard Thomas say today, access preparedness to support a PSI Climate Ambition Coalition. It's not only that, Allianz is leading a global initiative on, on creating global ESG guidance for insurance underwriting, which we will launch in uh, Munich in February. Insurers are taking the ocean's agenda in terms of illegal, unreported, and regulated fishing, and they are also gonna drive this to a new UNFFI initiative on the Sustainable Blue Economy Finance Initiative. Denis was with us in New York last September, to, uh, leading insurers and over 100 investors on uh, tobacco-free finance and how uh, that agenda is resonating around the world because statistically, uh, a billion people will die prematurely of tobacco-related illnesses if we don't turn the corner uh, this century. And that's the reason why insurers are coming to the agenda. You also have insurers committing with WWF and UNESCO to protect uh, the World Heritage Sites that are priced as irreplaceable as risk managers, insurers, and invest as, uh, investors as well. And you have companies like IAG shaping a national sustainable finance roadmap for Australia and New Zealand on this agenda. So that is the fast track uh, version of what the PSI is doing right now. What we want to get out of this panel, these are the leaders of leaders in sustainable insurance, is to hear from them what has been the journey for their companies on the PSI agenda and sustainability. I'll start, because we're in Paris, with AXA. Um, Denis, I mean, I've, I've known AXA for some time right now. You have been with AXA since 1995, and you have been chairman for a few years right now. And I have seen a massive transformation in the sustainability culture in AXA over the years. Can you give us an insight, Denis, on what AXA, how have you built that culture of sustainability at AXA? Well, I guess you've been uh, completely part of that journey, Butch, because uh, we, uh, we, when UNEPFI uh, uh, started this working group in which we participated, uh, I think in 2006, with uh, IAG uh, and, and a few others, uh, this led in 2012 uh, to uh, the uh, PSI, and I think the PSI are really a good, uh, a good framework uh, for insurance companies to uh, uh, think about the right, uh, think about the right issues. And I will not uh, redevelop the uh, the four principles, but this these four principles of uh, of the uh, PSI are really a great, a good framework for thinking. 
and uh, uh, we uh, so we have progress on our thinking in that on that topic and uh, in 2015 uh, uh, in the year of uh, cop 21 we have decided to accelerate our, our engagement and uh, move from uh, uh, i would say uh, uh, participating in a number of conversations, lobbying uh, as we uh, were uh, worried about the uh, impact of climate change to uh, tangible actions, uh, uh, which meant deciding to uh, exit coal as an investment category. Uh, and we am further amplified that with uh, uh, exiting uh, the uh, oil sands, uh, deciding not to insure anymore uh, coal manufacturers, uh, energy producers with uh, uh, more than 30% of coal content. And uh, more recently with our ex acquisition of Excel, you've heard Thomas this morning saying, we extend that to Excel, which is a, uh, which is a major uh, um, <coughs> commercial lines insurer and, uh, and reinsurer. So really it's a, it's a series of uh, steps on which uh, UNEPFI have been clearly uh, uh, helping us shape our, our thinking. And I believe that uh, now we still need a few other uh, uh, insurers and reinsurers to join, uh, as well as uh, more brokers, so that the totality of the insurance industry is aligned on those objectives. Thank you, Denis, for um, leading by example. I think um, I just wanted to touch on something that's also very important, because we're here in Paris, we are in Europe, uh, but the most vulnerable are low-income countries and uh, communities in developing countries. So, Denis, you wear a, another hat as chair of the Insurance Development Forum. Can you give us an insight on what that initiative is all about? So, this initiative is uh, really connected to the uh, G20 objective of uh, <coughs> ensuring 400 million po uh, people in developing uh, uh, countries that are impacted by, uh, uh, by climate change. 300 million through uh, sovereign and sub-sovereign in insurance schemes and 100 million through uh, inclusive insurance, what, uh, what people sometimes call micro-insurance. Uh, <coughs> we have, in 2016, creating this uh, insurance development forum, uh, the insurance industry, reinsurance industry, and, uh, and brokerage community, together with the uh, UNDP, United Nations Development Program, and, uh, and the World Bank, uh, because it is essential to, uh, uh, for this purpose to uh, bring together the public and the private sector. There are some... Uh, each side has some prejudices, but we need to work jointly and work also with donor countries to achieve that objective. And I am uh, <coughs> pleased to, uh, and so we have uh, a number of working groups in that uh, insurance development uh, forum covering uh, uh, sovereign, sovereign and sub-sovereign schemes, uh, inclusive insurance, regulation, because regulation is key to, uh, over to uh, achieve uh, better coverage uh, in, this, uh, in these markets. Uh, investments, because investment is also key, and uh, risk modeling, because uh, since uh, there is a low insurance penetration, modeling uh, data are quite scarce, and we need to bring together all the resources uh, so that uh, this, this, mo this modeling uh, improves. I'm, I'm pleased to announce that uh, uh, the uh, Insurance Development Pro uh, Forum has decided to be a, a supporting institution of uh, uh, the UNEP uh, PSI, uh, because we believe it's important uh, to show the, uh, um, I would say that the insurance industry is aligned with these objectives and especially the Insurance Development Forum. So there's two elements here that I want to highlight. AXA is showing us that if we have to deal with climate change, it's uh, adaptation and mitigation are two sides of the same coin. You cannot simply address a mitigation agenda and not have anything on adaptation and vice versa. As a leader also, they are also driving an agenda of collaborative action. This is what we heard from Thomas this morning. This is what we heard from Denis. It's consistent from the CEO and the chairman. <laughs> let's go. Uh, let's go to Australia. Um, Australia has, has had some, uh, a few prime ministers over the years, uh, Julie. IAG has also had a few CEOs. But a constant at Insurance Australia Group has been Julie Batch. She she, I call her Chief Julie because she used to be the Chief Risk Officer. Then she became the Chief Analytics Officer. And then she became the Chief Customer Officer. And now she's co-chair of the PSI. So Chief Julie, can you give us an insight 
on, on IAG and your journey. You have been there, and I have to say together with Jackie Johnson, who's also here, as constant uh, and very resilient and very sustainable, uh, sustainable insurance warriors. Thanks, Butch. I wish they called me Chief Julie at home, but they don't. <laughs> so before I start, I just want to commend um, you, Denny, today on your announcement. I think that making the statements that you have about the work that you're going to do with Excel is really, really significant and shouldn't be understated. So thank you for taking such a strong leadership position. Um, yeah, so Butch, as you said, IAG has been involved with the PSI since the beginning. Together with AXA, we were the first co-chair, and it's a position we're really proud to continue to hold today. Um, we were part of the team that designed the principles, which I would briefly summarise as embedment, transparency, uh, collaboration and influence. And they've really had a profound effect on our business and the way, the way that we think about, I don't know, risk and sustainability in our organisation. Um, the last few years for IAG has been about creating a really stable platform um, against those four principles that we can move forward on. Um, both at an organisational level, but really also around the way that we think about sustainability in insurance um, as a country. Uh, and when I say country, I mean Australia and New Zealand. Um, so perhaps a couple of points. From, from an embedment point of view within our organisation, uh, it's really been around reviewing and aligning our portfolios and making sure uh, that, that we are transparent and understand deeply uh, the exposures that we carry across um, our investments, uh, across multiple facets. So not just environmental, um, we now carry about 1% of our investments that are exposed to carbon industries. And for those 1%, we do a lot of work with those companies in trying to understand what their plans and their roadmaps are for transitioning. But we also report regularly, so quarterly, on a number of other areas such as um, tobacco, sustainable fishing, butch you'll be happy to know that, ammunitions and child labour. So we look at all of those elements. Um, around transparency, uh, IAG, together with National Australia Bank, who are here today, hosted the um, UNEP FI Regional Roundtable, and we're in the process of uh, working together with 300 institutions to build a financial um, sustainability roadmap. Um, in, term of, in terms of collaboration, uh, we, we worked early on, um, perhaps on the prequel to Encore, uh, which was a global risk map that brought together a lot of um, natural perils modelling and a lot of the information that you, the United Nations hold to display that visually so people could really understand and vulnerable communities could really understand that they were significantly exposed to natural perils, but they also had lack of access to clean water, telecommunications, schooling and so on, making them really vulnerable. Um, and then finally, uh, the thing that perhaps we're most proud of at IAG is about creating that baseline for Australia in terms of our understanding of risk, which was the formation of the Australian Business Roundtable for Disaster Resilience and Safer Communities, which was one of the first um, public-private partnerships uh, that, that, that sort of existed, I believe, and we brought together um, Westpac Bank, Investor Property Group, Munich Re Reinsurance, um, Optus, which is part of the Singtel group, the Australian Red Cross and ourselves to collaborate, share our data uh, and influence government around the way that it thought about disaster mitigation, which I believe is a significant part of adaptation as well. So how we need, might think differently and invest in mitigation to make our communities safer. We were able to identify from that research that a $250 million investment uh, annually would prevent $12 billion annually by 2050 of disaster costs. In that work, we deliberately stayed away from the words climate and change um, because what we wanted to show that actually this was a problem right now that our government needed to address. What we're now doing is stepping forward and looking at how climate change and the various different scenarios might impact that baseline work. And we've had a an incredible amount of engagement with government and the whole of the community around that activity. Thanks, Julie. And I can summarize that initiative as an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. Um, uh, Julie, also, I just wanted to say you've been quite humbled because that initiative of the Australian Business Roundtable on Disaster Resilience and Safer Communities won an award at the World Conference in Disaster Risk Reduction in Japan. That also inspired your peers in Canada on what they can do on flood resilience in Canada, so much so that they created a flood insurance product 
for overland flood insurance for residential homeowners in Canada. And we have our Canadian peers here who can attest to that. So thank you, Julie, for that. Just one quick follow-up, Julie. The, why did IAG enhance its climate action agenda? <laughs> why did we enhance it? Yes. <laughs> Well, I think it's interesting. Uh, we've talked a lot today, and the last, the last panel was about how do you activate change. And uh, recently, and if you look at any one of our executives' LinkedIn profiles, you'll see very emphatic um, videos from each of us where we make a commitment to climate action that is embedded in our financial performance, our individual financial performance. So it is our view that a great way to get change is to incentivise it, and so our 12 executives are required to demonstrate action against a, a very detailed plan, which is on our website, and everybody's welcome to have a look at it, a very detailed plan that we believe will drive change in a time horizon that is relevant. So, um, so we're pretty excited about that. We think there's always more that can be done. Thank you, Julie. And last but not the least, we have uh, the most famous insurance commissioner in the world, probably. <laughs> Commissioner Dave Jones from the California Department of Insurance. California is the largest insurance market in the U.S. This is the fourth largest insurance market in the world. I have so many Dave Jones stories, I'll pick two. One, t people are talking about TCFD, but in 2008, the U.S. National Association of Insurance Commissioners led by California, New York, Washington State, et cetera, we're already talking about climate risk disclosure by insurance companies. In a sustainability horizon that's light years away, almost 10, uh, a decade before we were talking about TCFD. That's one. Number two, I first, uh, I first met Dave in New Orleans at the NAIC meeting because he wanted to understand what UNEBFI was doing international, internationally on climate change action and bring it um, and tried to assimilate that. And then um, it was like a congressional inquiry. It was like a Supreme Court appointee, a nominee, being grilled. But the, the question that I, I, I got from California was, can we sign the principles for sustainable insurance? That's a regulator asking whether they can sign the principles for, and that gave us an idea. Why not? It will give a signal from insurance supervisors that these uh, sustainability issues are material. So California signed it, the Australian regulators signed it, Brazil uh, signed it, Morocco, uh, Philippines, um, etc. So Dave, um, what has been this journey for California in the context of sustainability? Would you uh, care to elaborate? Well, thank you, Butch. That's very kind. Um, I think I'd like to start by saying that uh, as an insurance regulator, uh, obviously, uh, it's been critically important to get the views of industry and in particular the views of PSI with regard to climate risk and climate change. And there's no question that uh, PSI and its member insurers uh, like AXA, like IEG, have played an important role in informing the views and regulatory approaches of insurance supervisors. So in California, as Butch noted, uh, we've been leading uh, for some time now a uh, qualitative survey of insurance companies' responses to climate change and climate risk in their business operations, their underwriting, and their investing. Uh, but um, these concerns uh, evolve over time, and as we got those survey answers back, I concluded that one area that insurers in the United States needed to focus more on was transition risk and the risk that uh, climate change posed to their investment portfolios. And so in early 2016, I took two actions. One. Uh, requiring the uh, 1,300 insurance companies that I oversee that have about $5 trillion in assets under management to disclose to me and publicly their investments in fossil fuels, oil, coal, gas, and utilities that derive more than 50% of their electricity from fossil fuels. Second, um, I asked uh, insurers to divest from thermal coal because I concluded that that particular asset ran a very high risk of becoming a stranded asset and also uh, took note of what companies like AXA and others were doing uh, in that regard. Uh, flash forward a little bit, uh, we were proud to be a signatory to the PSI, uh, pleased to fully support the TS TCFD and its work. Um, I'm proud to have been the founding chair of a consortium of insurance regulators across the globe called the Sustainable Insurance 
uh, forum, uh, which shares best practices and approaches amongst regulators with regard to sustainability, but in particular with regard to climate. And more recently, uh, taking heed of the strong recommendation in the TCFD report that uh, all economic enterprises ought to undertake scenario analysis with regard to climate risk as it relates to their investment portfolios, but particularly insurance companies ought to do it. Um, we engage with Two Degree Investing Initiative to perform a scenario analysis on the portfolios of the 600 largest insurance companies in California's market and then provide detailed analyses and reports to those companies. And so the work continues to evolve, but I think uh, it's important to note that uh, we have drawn from the expertise represented in PCI, and I think it's really exciting earlier this month that uh, PSI rather announced uh, that the insurers uh, in PSI are gonna work on a collaborative effort to further refine the methodologies and tools available to assess what risks face them, both in their underwriting and their reserving. So it's been an exciting relationship. Right, Dave, you mentioned about the Sustainable Insurance Forum. Uh, would you want to share with us what are the focus areas for the Sustainable Insurance Forum for Supervisors? For me, it's like the PSI for Supervisors. Uh, or what is the agenda for next year? It's very progressive. I was in Luxembourg. The European Insurance and Occupational Pensions Authority was there. Uh, the Japanese Financial Services Agency was there, and you were there. Uh, what is the agenda for next year? So the Sustainable Insurance Forum is a group of insurance regulators from across the globe who are concerned about sustainable insurance in, in broad measures, but in particular concerned about climate risk. And uh, just uh, last year, uh, we worked on an important joint paper with the body called the International Association of Insurance Supervisors, which is the accrediting body and standard setting body for insurance supervision globally. And that joint paper identified the emerging risks in this area, but also best practices that insurance supervisors are undertaking across the globe. Um, our objective uh, is now to do another paper uh, taking the TCFD recommendations and making them more concrete and mapping them against what's called the insurance uh, core principles, which are the supervisory principles of the International Association of Insurance Supervisors, sort of the DNA of insurance supervision and map the TCFD recommendations and make them more concrete and applicable and align them with the insurance core principles. And our hope is to eventually make sure that the recommendations of the TCFD are taken up into the core practice of insurance supervision. And so it's exciting work. Um, and I know there are a lot of work streams that are uh, paralleling this sort of work in the insurance space as well. Uh, but that's uh, one of our main objectives for the next year. Thank you, Dave. I will just ask you one quick follow-up question. You can say yes, no, or uh, wait till the cows go home. Is the question is, should TCFD be mandatory? So I think it's important to underscore that the TCFD itself was uh, led by industry, uh, by leaders across sectors of the economy, and made a series of important recommendations uh, that are voluntary in nature. But I think those recommendations are so important, uh, particularly as it relates to disclosures, uh, that they ought to ultimately be made mandatory, uh, much as uh, the French government has done with its important article. Um, I think it's just uh, too important uh, to leave to uh, decision making of individual companies. Now we're a bit of a ways from that point, uh, but thanks to the leadership of important companies like those represented here and the uptake of these recommendations by supervisors, I'm hoping that we'll see broader dissemination, utilization, and compliance with those recommendations. So, Because our 30 minutes became 20 minutes, we won't have a Q&A with the audience. But in the meantime, I have created a new formula for sustainability while listening to the three uh, uh, speakers we have. This formula for sustainability has three elements. Leading by example is one. Collaboration multiplied by collaboration, raised to the power of ambition. That is the formula that we have heard from these people. They are leading by example, they want collaborative action, and they have ambition. So as a parting shot, I would like to give each one a short statement on how to drive that ambition on sustainability. We'll start with Julie, since you're laughing. <laughs> I can't remember the formula, Butch. Um, so, so how to, I think it comes from a place of passion. 
So how do you find enough people in your organisation that care so deeply to change um, and bring them together and, and start to drive to a different outcome is how you reach your formula. Um, what I'm quite excited about is the first part, or the second part, I've forgotten it, the collaboration bit. Because I would say that the work that we've been doing over the last few years, the work that we're now do, doing through the FI um, program is really about collaboration. It's, this is one of the very few areas where industry comes together for a common good. We often compete with each other. This is one place where it does not feel like competition. It feels like how we all work for a better planet, and that's pretty exciting. The Dean? <laughs> I think that uh, everybody is, is uh, trying to uh, avoid uh, change because change is disturbing. And uh, I believe that uh, the only way to uh, get the org any organization to change is to show the upside. Uh, and uh, I mean, when, when I think about, uh, uh, I mean, I reflect three years back when we had the discussion about uh, uh, making a, a statement on, on our investments uh, in coal and uh, uh, insurance of uh, coal manufacturers and, and uh, accelerating our investment in green investments. Uh, I think showing the upside was, uh, was absolutely uh, key. Uh, and uh, the people that uh, were resisting the most at the time six months later uh, thought, I mean, looked at the uh, issue of stranded assets and, and saw that we had made the right decision, uh, looked at the opportunity of being more visible in that space and saw the upside in terms of reputation for the company. So I think you need to, uh, to get people on board, you need to show them the upside. Okay, passion, the upside, Dave? I think the industry leadership has been very, very important, uh, AXA, IEG, other companies. Uh, it has confirmed the work that uh, regulators are doing in this space, and I think that uh, both industry and regulators can draw from one another uh, and continue to urge uh, each other to aspire to accomplish more in this area. And at the end of the day, if we don't, uh, we face an existential threat, uh, a world in which uh, uh, you've been quoted as indicating that the temperature rises four degrees Celsius is not an insurable world. Right now in California, we're having a test case as to whether a world in which the temperature rises 1.5 degrees Celsius is an insurable world. As the campfire ripped through Northern California, took 83 lives, destroyed 13,000 single family structures, 18,000 structures, and 150,000 acres of land. And so uh, we need to do more, we need to do it more quickly, uh, and we need to collaborate as we're doing it. Yes, as a final word, um, just to let you know that the, today's AXA announcement was not a one-off. Uh, they want to continue this discussion. So um, Denis is kindly hosting and welcoming AXA's fiercest competitors from around the world to the AXA headquarters uh, tonight for a dinner on how to drive uh, ambitious climate and ocean action by the insurance industry. Thank you very much for that, Denis. Thank you to the three C's of sustainable insurance leadership, Commissioner Dave, Chief Julie, Chairman Denis.